second speaker will be Nick uh, Enfield. Um, he is a professor in linguistics at the University of Sydney, director of the Sydney Social Sciences and Humanities. You can read it all. And he will talk about the evolution of languages, evolutions of language. I guess the S is on purpose. Uh, but Nick is uh, also the recipient of the, I don't, don't know how to pronounce it, the IG Nobel Prize, which is the Nobel Prize for, I, for crazy ideas, I think, for his study on the word a, uh, which you spell U H. So it is time to listen to the talk by Nick Enfield. Nick, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, it's a real delight to be here, and um, as you're all no doubt thinking, it's um, to come is quite an act to follow, so I uh, um, enjoyed the talk immensely, and in fact, um, I'm pleased to say that there's a really good complementarity here, so I'm going to be moving into um, a couple of areas uh, that really I think complement well, and go, uh, go into areas that um, Tecumseh didn't go into, so I think that's, um, hopefully there'll be some good complementarity there. Um, so a few preliminaries. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I just want to say how much, uh, how grateful I am to be here. It's wonderful uh, to be in Singapore and to be here um, at the university and uh, just had wonderful hosts and um, so I'm very pleased at the generosity of the invitation. Um, a few preliminaries. Oops, I'll just turn this on. Um, a few preliminaries. One um, sort of relates to the brief that I was given. So as you heard earlier on, um, you know, we're talking about various orders of magnitude um, and we've heard um, already in the first talk um, something about the origin of the capacity for language in, in, in our species. Um, in an email that I was sort of looking back over what am I asked to talk about, there was this phrase, the development of languages. Uh, and that's really something quite significantly different. And um, in the uh, and what we heard um, earlier from, from, from Jan about the different sort of frames of these, uh, of each event in this series, uh, the event for next time um, mentioned the term cultural evolution and the development of languages really is a matter of cultural evolution. So what I'm going to be doing is actually kind of linking forward into that uh, realm for part of what I want to talk about, but I think that's quite apt given that we're talking about language and one of my themes is going to be um, you've really got to think about causal processes in language that happen at different, within different temporal causal scales or possibly different um, time frames. And that's what I was really getting at when I uh, picked that title, the evolutions in the plural um, of language. More technically, it would be the various temporal causal frames in which language could be said to evolve, but it's not quite as pithy. So um, that's really basically related to the second point of preliminary, um, which is, of course, we can be talking about several different things, and it comes to lay that out really nicely at the beginning, so I'm not going to rehearse those uh, distinctions we're looking at when we talk about the evolution of language or the development of language or evolutionary processes in language. We're talking about different things. Sometimes we're talking about the capacity, the human capacity for, for acquiring language, and within that, many different things, as we've just been hearing. Um, we might be talking about language as a general phenomenon, what its core um, features might be, or we might be talking about individual languages, French, Spanish, Japanese, etc. So we want to keep that in mind as well. And so this is sort of to emphasize the point that we already heard, but to keep it in mind that um, when we talk about language, we're talking about multiple phenomena, multiple things we might observe if we're looking at language as a kind of human behavior. Uh, we're looking at multiple capacities that humans have. Uh, we're looking at multiple temporal causal frames to observe the processes we're interested in observing. Um, and of course, we're talking about something that has had a transformative development for our species, um, not only uh, you know, in terms of these kind of watershed moments in, in, in the evolution of the species, but in terms of our cultures. And also for us as individuals, when we acquire language, it's a transformative moment uh, in our lives. So I'm going to have two parts to the um, talk this afternoon. The first one uh, will talk about linguistic phenomena that the evolved language capacity needs to support. And these are going to, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, will complement the things that we heard um, earlier on. So I'm going to be interested here in looking at the use of language in social interaction and the kinds of capacities that people have to have when they are conversing, which is the, you know, the sort of main modality in which we use language. We use language, of course, in many, many different ways. Here I am doing a monologue. 
Uh, but when we learn language, when we use language, most of the time we're doing it in a dialogic setting and there's a lot of features to that type of behaviour and I'm going to focus on one of them uh, in the first part. And the second part, I want to address a problem um, that a model of the cultural evolution of languages, in the plural, must solve. So this is addressing the second brief. Um, and that's the question of how linguistic systems come to, to exist. Um, so the, it's a very different question from the question of how the capacity for learning language comes to exist. Um, so, you know, you could uh, imaginably take an individual uh, from a certain time, some hundreds to thousands of years ago, um, and bring them here in, in a time machine, they would just learn the language you would expose them to, right, if they had a modern capacity. Um, but at that time, there were no languages to learn. So, of course, there's this issue of, you know, how did it come about that the languages themselves um, evolved and how do they continue to evolve today? So I'll be drawing on some of the, the, the things that I discussed in these two uh, books. The first one um, is actually the next one. Um, so that's coming out a bit later this year. And in that book, I'm arguing that language is grounded in human cooperative instincts. And this is in addition to the many things that, um, that Tecumseh was just uh, talking about, um, the kind of basic capacities. Um, you know, we had speech and, and semantics and syntax. Um, and I want to add something like sociality to that. Uh, so we'll, we'll call it a fourth S and we'll see how you like it. Um, then, um, in, this, in this 2014 book, um, which will sort of relates to the second part of what I want to talk about today, what I'm interested in emphasising here is the idea that there are distinct but interconnected causal frames for understanding how languages come to be the way they are. Uh, and so I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that uh, to start with, and then we'll go into the two parts. So, what do I mean by causal temporal frames? Well, um, the kind of framing for these 10 on 10 events was an arbitrary specification of uh, numbers of years, uh, you know, by, by powers of 10. And that's not the kind of um, temporal scale that I'm talking about. I'm talking about not orders of magnitude, but orders of causality, okay? So these are the frames um, that I have found to be useful when I'm thinking about uh, the development of language, and these are not the only possible frames. Many different people um, have tried to sort of enumerate and sort of uh, uh, specify a, you know, a whole set of different kind of uh, orders of magnitude in, in, in causal processes. Um, so one way to do that is arbitrarily just specify numbers of seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and years and so on. Many people have done this. Um, but what I'm more interested in thinking about distinct kind of causal frames, uh, and these are the six here that, I, um, that I've found useful and I'm going to talk about um, a few of them, but mainly concentrate on one. So as you can see, they spell mopeds, which obviously has no relation to their meaning. It's just a nice way to remember um, what, um, what they are. So if you um, do undergraduate uh, linguistics, you will learn the distinction between uh, the diachronic and the synchronic sort of views of language. And I'm talking about um, languages, okay? So if you want to uh, study, let's say, French grammar, um, you can describe that in terms of um, what's a sewer called a synchronic view, and that would be to say, forget about anything to do with the history of the language, how it came to be the way it is. Just look at the relationships that exist between all the words and structures in the language. That's, that's how you can describe the language, and that's called a synchronic uh, description of the language. Alternatively, you can think about the language as a product of historical processes, and that would be, um, that would allow you to give an account for why the language is the way it is, but the diachronic uh, explanation for how a language is, that tells you something about the language, but it doesn't necessarily tell you, for example, what is represented in the mind uh, of the child who has just successfully acquired the language because they don't, they don't have access to the language's history and so forth. Um, so this is an important distinction um, in sort of, you know, everyday uh, linguistics. I'm working down from the top um, of this list, uh, so the microgenetic processes, I'm talking more about things that uh, will be included in uh, psycholinguistics and the psychology of language, so that's really the psychological processes that occur sort of the frame of, of, of milliseconds and so forth, sending our kind of motor commands to our um, vocal tracts and so forth. Um, the ontogenetic, um, of course, the frame of learning language in individuals' uh, lifetimes, but also including learning second languages and how language evolves through a lifetime. 
the phylogenetic frame, that's really looking at um, the kinds of questions of evolution we've just been hearing about. Um, and then this um, last one here, the anchronic frame, is the one that I'll say a little bit more about um, in this first section. So this is not a term that is well, um, I mean, it's, I just made it up, right, because it's a, it's a concept that requires a term, um, and so I'm going to talk about um, causal processes in um, an anchronic frame. So that's going to be um, part one of what I want to talk about now. So what do I mean by an anchronic frame? So this is a particular frame through which to look at processes of language, and it has to do with the to and fro of social interaction. Okay, so while we're processing language, um, while we're learning language, which is sort of individual psychological processes, we're involved in the to and fro of social interaction. I'm saying something, uh, you're saying something back. There's a very particular relationship between the things that people say, um, and they're governed by norms, social norms, um, and they are made possible to a great extent by uh, aspects of our social intelligence um, that we can that we can uh, study if we look at things like joint action, um, social commitments, and so forth. And these things you will see as soon as you look at language in social interaction, where you've got two people. Um, the sort of classical minimal uh, notion of, of an interaction here. Two people uh, oriented physically towards each other, exchanging uh, uh, utterances and therefore doing what we call having a conversation or using language in a constructive kind of way. So I want to concentrate on some uh, of, a lot of what I've done um, in recent years has been really to look at uh, a number of the properties of language from an anchronic perspective. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of those things today. I'm just going to focus on uh, a small part of that. And so let's get into it by starting out with a kind of a core piece of the sort of anchronic structure of language, and that would be the idea of asking a question and getting a response. Okay, so it's a very simple thing in language. You ask a question, you get a response. We do this thing all the time, but it actually has some very interesting uh, properties. So here's a kind of a classic uh, example of this from a recorded telephone call. He's had sounds. You know Al Pepper? Yeah. Okay, so completely innocuous little um, question response sequence that plays out just as we would um, hope it would. Now, what's not seen here is the fact that uh, Bud here has certain social obligations um, when he's being asked this question from John. Okay, so um, these things uh, don't surface when we see something play off nicely like this, but we see them surface when there are problems in how people deal with questions. So here's an example. Of, I don't, I'm not going to be playing recordings for all of these, so let's just look at it. Um, so you've got A and B in conversation. A asks a question. Is something bothering you or not? Then there's a silence for a second. No response. You get a pursuit, yes or no? Another long silence. Eh? You get another pursuit in a different form, and then finally, no. Okay? So one thing we see here is that in uh, social interaction in language, when people use something like a question, which we could examine syntactically if we wanted to, um, another aspect of asking a question is that it puts the other, one, other party under these normative um, obligations, these social obligations, which they are accountable for. So this is the kind of evidence for that, um, where we see people actually calling each other out and holding each other accountable for these normative obligations um, that are created through language. Here's another type of example. Oops. Um, Roger says, but tell me, is everybody like that or am I just out of it? So here's a question. Ken says, not to change the subject, but, well, don't change the subject, answer me. So here you've got something that should be also very familiar, um, but if you look at what's going on here, Roger is holding Ken to account, okay? Not just for saying something in that next slide, but for saying something that is in fact the required thing, that it was normatively required, you're supposed to answer a question now, okay? And you're not, you know, I can, I'm in my rights to hold you to account uh, for not doing that. And a third type of situation, uh, you've got Amy and Olive and Ruth together. Amy asks Olive this question. Does she call you and conversate with you on your phone? And instead of Olive answering, Ruth answers um, as we think of it and as what Amy says, Ruth answers for her. Now that would be uh, wasting minutes. Again, we see Amy ha is within her <coughs> rights to hold Ruth accountable for having flouted that norm. It says, no, it's Olive who I asked the question. She's got to answer. And, and you actually get a very clear evidence that this is what going is what's going on, Ruth apologises and then um, indeed Olive um, answers the question. 
So there's something quite fundamental here um, about the social obligations in social interaction uh, that, 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 that surface in the most everyday forms of language usage. So back to our question um, from John and Bud. In this case, you've got those sort of, you know, Bud is doing his part and it doesn't create any turbulence. Um, another thing that we want to sort of, uh, that I want to note here, which we'll be getting deeper into now, uh, is the timing properties of this little exchange. So there's only a quarter of a second gap, uh, just under a quarter of a second gap between the end of John's turn and um, the beginning of Bud's. You know Al Pepper? Yeah. Okay, so it just sounds like this kind of faintest little beat and then you get the air coming in quite fast. That's what's missing in the case that you saw before where uh, you know, um, B was being held accountable for not having uh, produced a response. And in fact, um, one of the things I'm going to uh, give you a little bit more data on in a second is it's the case around the world that there's this window of around about one second where you've got to produce the required response if it's of that kind of, you know, I've just asked you a question, okay? So if the, if the piece of communication that I've produced um, requires you to respond and you don't do so within about a second, then you're held socially accountable. So your, 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 your obligations now become public, they go on the table and you can be held to account. Um, so how that is and what supports that um, is one of the things that, uh, that, that we need to account for and that I'm interested in uh, delving deeper into. So timing matters between moves in social interaction using language. Um, so what we can do is actually delve into data from social interaction and measure the properties of timing between these kinds of moves, for example, a question followed by a response, or more generally, any two moves in a conversation. So let's get out of just question-response sequences and look at um, the sort of back and forth, back and forth of um, conversation. So you've got um, A and B having a conversation, time is running along the bottom there, um, and this is the kind of classical picture of what a conversation might be like. A talks, blah, 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 there's only one person speaking, and then B talks uh, uh, immediately after A has finished, blah, 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 switches back, so that's the kind of one speaker at a time uh, idea, and this sometimes um, actually happens. So here you've got a very short phone call um, in which you get a very uh, small kind of time lapses between uh, the end of one speaker's turn and the beginning of the other. So the, these numbers you can see here, this pointer doesn't point, um, the numbers that you can see before each line tell you, uh, uh, you know, it's a sort of 150 milliseconds in the first instance of silence, they're quite tight transitions. Here's how it sounds. Yeah. Okay. Right. Bye -bye, love. Again, um, very um, familiar, but also kind of amazing, right? So these people um, are just having a very simple, um, very quick, very business-like conversation, but it has these, these properties of, of, of very fine timing um, between the turns, and that, that, that entails not only all of the amazing stuff that they're doing with their vocal tracks and with their you know, formulation of syntactic structures and everything else, they're also monitoring the timing of the other um, and, they're, and they're aware of their own obligations and entitlements as well. This is one of these cases where those things haven't come to the surface and so you get very finely timed, um, nicely running uh, uh, little exchange. And I want to focus now on the, on the timing properties of this. So the question is, you know, I've just cherry picked this little phone call for you and you're probably thinking, well, you know, there's overlap, happens all the time in conversation and there's gaps all the time in conversation. So the first question is, you know, is this very general to a language or not? Um, well, with colleagues, um, I uh, collected some data from Dutch, so these were essentially, um, you know, just dyadic uh, telephone calls, and we looked at um, around 1,500 turn transitions. So these are all transitions, not just questions and responses, but all turn transitions. We just uh, timed uh, how much, uh, we measured how much time passed between the end of person A's turn and the beginning of person B's turn for every transition. So that could be um, a positive value, which in which case that would be a, a silence, or it could be a negative value in which that would be um, an overlap. Okay, so here's what we found. So what you see here um, on the x-axis, um, the zero point there in the middle, um, that, that there's a, each bin is a 100 millisecond bin, so all, all um, instances in which the, uh, just to the right of the zero, 
um, in which they uh, people had a between zero and 100 millisecond gap between turns. That's what's uh, plotted there. So um, the um, y-axis is just the proportion of all the cases that we had. So what you can see is a very clear um, unimodal distribution uh, right around zero and in fact just a tiny little bit after zero is the crucial kind of thing here, the average being around about something like 200 millisecond gap. So one thing worth noting here is that um, you know, in, in, in the psycholinguistics of speech production, it's the, the, the basic finding for uh, formulating utterances based on something you've just seen, for example, is it takes at least half a second um, to you know, go through all the motions of you know, pulling up uh, the word for the thing that you want to talk about, formulating the sentence that you want to um, talk about it in, and then to you know, send the uh, instructions to your um, vocal anatomy to produce the sound and so forth. That takes at least a half second, um, depending on what it, what it is that you have to do. Um, and so data like this have been used as evidence to, see that, to say that a lot of the time when people are talking in conversation, what they're actually doing um, is waiting, they're, they're, they're able to, they're not, they're not waiting for the other person to stop, they're actually predicting when the other person is going to stop and they're launching uh, their turn as the other person is finishing. So it requires um, not only all of the sort of for, you know, production capacities, but this kind of um, anticipation of what the other one is doing on top of the kind of social normative uh, considerations that I mentioned. There's a point about the Dutch data you see here is that um, it is this very sort of clear uh, finding that you've got, a, you've got a tendency towards one speaker at a time minimizing the gaps and overlaps um, and so the question is then, well, what about other languages? Well, um, other people um, that I've been working with on this um, went and looked at other languages closely related to Dutch, so this is the results from English, a uh, much larger corpus. Again, very, very similar distribution, so you're getting the peak um, around about 200 milliseconds here, um, and German, pretty much exactly the same thing. So you see the three languages um, laid out here. Um, quite a strong kind of... Um, uh, commonality and so of course you're looking at that say well Dutch, English, German they're very closely related languages they don't have exactly the same uh, cultural um, context as we all well know um, but of course one needs to go and test the diversity um, of other languages so that's what I did with um, with a, a number of colleagues we went to um, field sites in a number of places in the world that are um, shown here with the black dots and we collected uh, conversations on video, so this is sort of a very much a fieldwork based um, form of collecting data. We got the conversations on video, and we uh, in this in this study we focused on uh, on questions and actually on a particular type of question, a yes no question, um, in order to kind of control the sorts of environments that we were measuring in. Um, all languages have these, um, and so what we found was that we were able to get quite a, a, a number of these yes no questions and simply measure the timing properties of how long it took before the end of the, from the end of the question to when the respondent began to produce their answer. So these are the data from Dutch. I'm sorry about the small size of it, but I need to leave space for all the others, which I'll show you in a second. Um, so this essentially replicated um, the material we had from the Dutch telephone call data. This is face-to-face -face data here, which you see. And so you can just see from, it's the same plot, um, but without the bins, it's just a line here, which shows you that there's a little bit of a, um, uh, it sort of lumps out slightly um, on the right hand side of the zero showing um, that the average kind of uh, transition between turns in these in these cases so it's something like about 300 uh, questions here being measured um, the average is slightly after zero so it's a small gap something like 200 milliseconds but not um, um, you know not zero and also not a whole second or anything like that what about all the other languages pretty much the same kind of situation. So you've got languages from Laos, uh, you know, in this part of the world, to Seltal in Central America, Yelidne in New Guinea, uh, Haikom in Southern Africa, etc. cetera. Um, what we're finding there is slightly different distributions, but not, nothing radically different, and no sort of, you know, bimodal distributions where half the time um, we're leaving big gaps and half the time we're doing sort of large forms of overlap. So that we took this to be evidence that there was um, for a similar type of system for turn taking in social interaction where people were trying to minimize uh, or to, to hit a certain target in when they respond to uh, questions. Okay, and that target should be somewhere um, around 
uh, leaving only a very small gap, if any gap at all. Now, if we get a little bit closer into the data here, um, this, what this shows is the same, I um, mean, it's drawn from the same data as what you just saw, but it shows you um, along the um, x-axis, what you see there is, um, you know, the zero point is uh, the point where you've got zero gap and zero overlap, that is zero milliseconds between the end of the question and the beginning of the response. Um, and the, 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 uh, the number that you see for each language is the mean for all of those responses with a, with a standard deviation on either side. So what this shows you is that, for example, on average, Japanese speakers and cell tile speakers are responding to questions relatively fast. Um, and Danish speakers and Taikong speakers are responding um, relatively slow. When we talk about how fast and how slow we respond, um, but this is a uh, much uh, smaller kind of difference than what you would normally find in the ethnographic record. So people will write about language differences and say, uh, you know, in this part of the world they leave this you know, five seconds gap before they answer a question, or in this part of the world there's, you know, people always talk at the same time. What we find, what this evidence shows is that there are differences um, in the sort of calibration, the metric for the timing of responding in social interaction, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, of, it's quite a much smaller order than what people normally report. Although psycholinguistically it's quite a big difference, a couple of hundred milliseconds on either side of the uh, on either side of the average, which English is around about the average, just a bit, you know, just a bit under a, a quarter of a second gap. Um, so psycholinguistically, it is um, a big uh, difference between languages, and that kind of gets blown up um, when you then report on your experience in speaking another language. So the you know the fact that say Danish speakers will wait another 200 milliseconds before responding to a question on average makes you know your average English speaker say, wow, you know, they're so slow. Um, you know, they have to wait, you know, a minute before they respond. Actually, it's 200 milliseconds. But um, so we're finding with further work. So, for example, work on uh, different kinds of um, they're not different kinds of languages, but languages from, you know, that, where we haven't got this sort of data. For example, um, current work going on in Aboriginal Australia is showing that um, y yes, this is supporting this basic view from what we see from from Danish, for example, that languages can be relatively sort of late in relation to something like English, but they're still following the same sort of shape of distribution and responding. So I want to sort of get into a further question in relation to the data here, and we'll just focus on English um, first. So, I mean, if you look at this English data, what that's showing is that the average response to a question in this set of measures that we had is around about, you know, 200 plus milliseconds. But also it shows you that sometimes there are faster responses and sometimes there are slower responses. So one of the questions we wanted to get into, um, which takes us back to this question of the normative structure that surrounds language usage, was why, when people are slower at responding, why is that? When people are faster at responding, why is that? It could just be random, right? Um, but it also could be um, governed by some sort of um, principle. So um, we drew on on proposals that had been made um, on, about the meaning of uh, slow versus fast responses in literature, mostly written about English, um, and found, for example, so one of the measures we looked at was the idea um, that there's a distinction between gi giving an answer and giving some other kind of response that's not an answer. So an answer would be to a yes-no question, an answer would be either yes or no, um, and a non-answer would be something like I don't know, or go ask John, or any other thing. I forget, etc. And what we found here, what this um, shows here, is that for English, um, there is a, a, a significant difference and a clearly very strong difference between uh, the, the white. So the white bar goes up to the point of average for um, answers to questions, and so that is around you know, it's, with, it's under 200 milliseconds, as you can see, um, but uh, well under. Um, but the non-answer responses went way up to 600 milliseconds plus. So that's a very long um, kind of a wait. So you've got a strong distinction there between the answers that get given and the non-answers that, that, that get given. Once you distinguish between those two things, then the data split in this interesting kind of way. And this was supported by all of the languages. So um, what you can see here is that for all of them, so we did a coding study where we distinguished between the answers and the non-answers, and this is what we found. Some of the languages showed bigger differences than others, but they all showed a significant um, difference. There might be some kind of processing explanation for this, but there also might be um, social interactional explanations. 
Um, some of our um, colleagues, so for example, uh, Felicia Roberts has looked at this in, um, uh, in English and also in other languages since actually um, in an experimental setting and just simply, uh, you know, essentially measured and showed experimentally something which we can all um, intuitively feel is the case. So she took uh, questions like, can I get a ride over there? Uh, and she had people listen to these questions. Um, and then in a one second window that followed the end of that question, uh, she would just play the same um, response, sure, um, but at different, with different time delays and just ask people to rate how, uh, uh, you know, how strongly, um, how agreeable is the person who says sure. It's the same word, right? So linguistically it's the same, you know, utterance, um, but the amount of time that, uh, that, is, that passes makes a difference for people's judgment as to whether this person is more willing or less willing, okay? So there could be sort of a signal of um, a processing here. Um, you know, it might, it might take you more time to decide to say yes when you're not willing, um, but also there might be some element of social signal here where you're sort of, um, there's, a, there's a sort of a theory of what we call preference, uh, which says, I'm actually going to do something to delay uh, this. And you saw those examples earlier on where a delay in responding, in fact, it was accountable, people were held to account for delaying, but it was also, it correlates with that delay, with the response being not the one the person was going for. So there's a sort of exquisite sensitivity to the expectations of the other, um, and that affects not only what you say, but how much time you leave um, to say it. So when we're looking at these kind of elements of language and social interaction, we're seeing a few um, things that you know, are clearly controlled very well by humans and that are very important in, in, in language usage and social interaction. Um, one of them has to do with the timing properties. We're seeing very fine timing here. Um, so, so fine that it entails uh, online kind of prediction and modeling of what the other one is going to say so that you can launch your own turn before they're quite finished. So that involves really quite a sort of high cost uh, processing. There's, of course, a very important sense of contingency, um, which I haven't said much about now, but it's, it should be fairly obvious in the sense that when you say something, uh, you know, what I have to formulate has to fit what you've said, right? Um, and, and if it doesn't, then there are problems, you know, sort of pragmatic problems and so forth. And we know that these problems will arise. So not when we're having a very sort of everyday conversation that's running off just fine, it seems completely easy. But when we think about all the possible things we could have said, what we see is that people are in fact very, very uh, uh, carefully staying on track and formulating utterances that are, you know, not only uh, require all of the all of the processing for just getting uh, selecting words and producing uh, sort of phrases and so forth, but they're doing so in a way that's relevant. And so each move, when you respond to what someone said, what you're doing is changing the possibilities for what can be said next and so forth. So there's um, a lot of issues there. And then thirdly, um, the, the, this matter of normative enforcement of how language gets used in these conversational contexts. So that was what I started out with, where that's been taken as evidence, for example, by people like uh, the psychologist at Stanford, Herb Clark, um, who's kind of promoted the idea that this type of normative enforcement in social interaction is evidence that language use is, in fact, a form of joint action. So you actually wouldn't get language um, operating in the way that it operates without the, the, the human species having the capacity for joint action in a very particular sense. Uh, and that's been um, the argument of people like, for example, Michael Tomasello and his uh, views of language evolution. A very quick um, reference to a little bit of uh, non-human data here, uh, just by way of comparison, and uh, to come say we'll know more about this than I do, but I just want to refer to a couple of studies. Um, so one here is from um, a, a paper by Takahashi et al. on marmoset fee calls. Um, and the, the paper, in fact, has the, the word turn-taking in the title, and talks about turn-taking. And this is a perfectly, you know, it's fine, let's call it turn-taking. What we see here, so this is just, um, this just shows you the temporal properties of these two marmosets uh, producing fecals, call, fee so that's just a kind of a, a call uh, that says, hey, I'm over here, um, and they've got these two marmosets in a lab and um, with a screen between them, and they produce this kind of back and forth, back and forth call. But they typically look kind of like this, where you've got some, the timing properties, you've got something like five to 10 seconds passing between each move. Um, so even if 
marmosets have some sort of different sense of time. Um, it's obviously a different kind of system that the call of the other is completely finished, you wait a little while, then you produce your one. So there's an alternation, but not this very sort of, not this sense of prediction, uh, gearing up to produce my call as soon as your call will be finished. Um, and then the other, of course, obvious point here is that you don't have that kind of contingency relation between moves um, in the use of this communicative system. So it's always the same call that you're producing. Um, and it's not that you know you have to think, well, which call am I going to make now, given that the other one just made this other call. Um, and uh, very importantly here, there's no normative regulation. So, uh, you know, it, well, I'd be very interested to know, actually, for those who know about um, animal communication, are there any analogues to someone saying, hey, I did my fee call, where's yours? Okay, so just like we saw, hey, I asked you a question, we get that all the time, and we know we're in our rights to hold others accountable for producing, for answering our questions. Do we ever have in the animal world uh, this type of um, uh, enforcement through sort of normative um, calling others out um, in terms of the norms? Another example from Siaman Great Calls from this part of the world. Um, we've got these very complex sequences, um, such as the one described here. So you've got a male, uh, so there's the seconds running down on the left. Um, you've got a male producing all these different calls um, in one column and a female in another column. You've got here a very tight kind of timing between the, the different parts. There's a kind of duet here that you see between these two uh, individuals. Very tight timing, a lot of overlap here, um, but it's not the same kind of thing. It's like a duet that's been written in advance. It's not like I am producing a new call um, touched off by the call that you made. So there is a kind of contingency between the calls because we've got to time them right, the two individuals. Um, but what, what, what the descriptions of these great call sequence in, in, sequences in Siamo say is that if something goes wrong, if, this, if something is missing, or if I produce the wrong uh, call at, the, at a certain moment, then the whole sequence is aborted. Okay? So they lack uh, the possibility to, um, well, it's not something I'm going to talk about today, but something that I've worked on, um, the possibility of what we call conversational repair, where I can say, sorry, what was that? Um, can, you, uh, can you do that part again? So then I, then I know what to produce now. So this is the work that I mentioned before. Uh -huh. um, these animals are doing something very sophisticated, but they cannot say, huh, and get the other one to repeat what they just did. Where you get something a little bit like that is not in vocal interactions, but uh, for example, in this work by um, Federica Rossano on Bonobo um, interactions. So this is a three-phase sequence. Here you see uh, an, an, an infant Bonobo is uh, making a gesture. It's called a wrist-bent gesture to get the parent, the mother, to, uh, to pick the infant up. And what you see here is that um, the infant will uh, first get the visual attention of the, of the mother, that's in panel B, and once that's happened, you see in panel B, they're producing the bent wrist gesture, and then it's taken up, um, you know, then the, the, the mother picks up the, um, uh, the baby. And what's interesting here is firstly the timing property, so these are very tightly timed, okay, so these are very tightly timed in the sense that we've got actions that um, give rise to following actions, and they're timed in a similar way to the uh, sequences we see in, in, in human use of language. Um, and of course there's a strongly contingent relation between the moves in social interaction here. If the mothers don't respond then what um, Rosano saw was that um, the infants will reposition themselves, move around into the uh, attentional field of the mother and will try again uh, and then eventually uh, get picked up. So it's not really the same as calling out the mother for not doing the proper thing but it does show a sense of persistence um, and redoing uh, the signal. So to summarise on this part, um, what I've been trying to talk about here is the idea that we can, uh, I, I want to highlight certain properties of language which need to be highlighted, I would argue, alongside of these, these, these questions of syntax and, uh, and semantics and so forth, and that is the sociality that is required to use language within an anchronic frame. So we can look at sentences, we can look at clauses, we can look at syllables and words. This is saying, let's look at the uh, relations between moves in social interaction and we start to see um, the, uh, the whole sort of you know, cognitive context in which that becomes possible, which is the cognitive context that allows joint uh, participation, that uh, enforces norms uh, and so forth. So those things are, um, to the extent that we have them, we have them in different ways um, and in a, to a more sort of extreme degree than in other animals and they are used 
uh, vary heavily in language. So what we're seeing is evidence of a universal system of fine timing in the to and fro of interaction, a kind of moral architecture, if you like, in how the system gets managed, and that is something that is quintessentially um, attached to language, and it's grounded in a capacity for um, what we might call joint action. And so the argument of that, that whole first part is really to say, here's some capacities that appear to be universal and they're certainly related to language, so therefore they need to be taken into account by any sort of uh, version of, um, you know, any, any kind of theory of how the capacity for language evolved one has to sort of draw those things in. So um, Tecumseh was referring to those in relation to things like uh, theory of mind and so forth. And I think though it's important to add to those kind of ideas this notion of shared intentionality and sort of joint action, which becomes a kind of moral uh, question. All right, so the second part then, and I'll, I'll try not to kind of um, go over my allotted time. Uh, the second part that, of, of what I want to talk about today will, I want to shift into, uh, you know, the cultural evolution of languages as uh, systems, and I want to keep in mind this enchronic view of language and sort of talk about how it might help us to understand uh, the cultural evolution um, of languages, which is something that, I mean, we have to really keep in mind that once, you know, the physiological and cognitive um, uh, capacities were in place, at some point, this, this sort of process had to gear up um, and such that we now today have all of these incredibly complex systems um, that we know of as um, language. So I want to focus on one kind of puzzle about the, uh, the notion that language has evolved through time, and that's the question of the unit of analysis. So where you get um, Darwin talking about uh, language from an evolutionary perspective, which he does from the very beginning, um, You've got, you know, on the one hand, this citation of Muller here talking about the words and grammatical forms that struggle for life. Okay, so there's a sort of focus on the idea of what, what, what some sociolinguists call uh, a linguistic item, that our, our sort of unit of analysis is an item. So you can think about this as the sort of switching between sort of genes versus organisms uh, as the unit of analysis, and, and this is what we see. So on the one hand, um, we're saying, okay, well, the, the items of language are in a struggle, for survival, and, and yet we're talking about language, languages, French versus German versus Japanese, as being like species, okay? So there's a very different idea here that essentially if, if you're talking about, you know, a language is like a species, uh, you're talking about, you know, perhaps let's say individual uh, brains that embody each of these languages, um, and then these, you know, compete that languages, you know, kids will go and learn another language instead. Um, so, but they're two very different things, right? So, like a word can can have a kind of a career and can evolve. It can be borrowed from language to language. It can go, you know, around the world without the whole language that it's part of going with it. Okay, and yet we talk about languages as if they are sort of organisms. So, the question I want to raise you is, what's the connection uh, between the item and the system in language? Uh, and when we're talking about language from an evolutionary perspective, what what's evolving? Okay, so that's what I'm interested in here. Well, if you just think about linguistic items, okay, so just words like say, you know, okay, for example, or hello, for example. So these would be words that have traveled around the world and they're doing very well. Um, we know a lot about how individual items spread through sort of social systems. Um, and, and so I want to just say a few things about that quickly. This is Leonard Bloomfield, the famous linguist, um, and he sort of captured this where he said individual forms may have had very different adventures. Talking about the individual forms of language, that they, um, that, that, that the words of a language can come, of course, from other languages, can break off from this language and go into that language, and some words can change faster than other words and so forth. So we're simultaneously thinking about systems and items at the same time. Well, we do know quite a lot about this, so if we look into the literature on, uh, you know, on sort of the innovation of technologies and so forth in sociology, um, we see the kind of classic uh, depictions like this one of how innovations uh, diffuse and come into a population. So the idea here is fairly clear, so the per percentage of adoption, that's the number of people in the, or the proportion of people in the population who do whatever it is that you're interested in, who use that word, for example, or pronounce the word in that way, for example, or it could be technologies who, who have a phone or who don't have a phone. Um, and when we go into a society and we look at, for example, what their language is like, 
Okay, what we're really doing is we're looking at conventions that have already completely diffused within that population. All right, so we're looking at the conventions that is that is the things that are at the end of a process of diffusion throughout um, a, a population. But of course, they were once upon a time innovations. Okay, so these every little change that happens in a language, we know from research on the, the sort of social history of languages, must have been innovated at some point by individuals, maybe numerous individuals at once, but they have to somehow find their way, th permeate throughout the whole population uh, before they can be um, learned by everyone and become convention in the language. And, and it's only that convention in the language that we, that we record when we make a synchronic description um, of language. Well, some people have attempted to sort of talk about this in cognitive terms, so people like Dan Sperber or Boyd and Richardson um, and others are sort of saying, all right, well, let's think about the causal, uh, what, what's the sort of causal mechanisms behind how bits of language can spread throughout a kind of population. And it's an oscillation, this is sort of really Dan Sperber's model of, of, of what he calls cognitive causal chains. It's an oscillation between uh, the public expression of, let's say, a word, that is when someone say, says a word, and the private um, representation um, of that. So if you sort of look at the various kind of links in this chain, you get different loci for transmission. So for example, if you think of a new word coming into a language, being borrowed from another language, um, you can, you can uh, focus on four points within this sort of constantly linking chain. So one is the point of exposure, so that is the link between the public manifestation of a sign, someone, for example, pronounces a word, and the, uh, when you hear it and it goes into your head. Um, the representation of that word or structure in your mind and brain. Um, then the replication of it, it's not going to diffuse unless you are then also motivated to use the word yourself. Um, and then the instantiation of it in that public setting. So is it um, a, a sound waves, is it something that you've written down, etc. And this just sort of keeps going and keeps going. Um, and the, the reason why I'm raising this is because these links in the chain are loci for transmission where different biases can operate. Okay, so if we look at, for example, the success of a certain word uh, that's entered into a language, the idea is it's passed through this, this chain of links in everybody's mind. Now everyone has uh, developed a representation of this term and uh, it has therefore passed through a, th a number of thresholds that would have otherwise stopped it um, uh, being spread. So there's a whole lot of literature about various different kinds of biases that either would inhibit or promote the spread of, of, a, of a bit of language or a bit of culture through um, a larger kind of setting. So here's some of the, if you look at the, the biases literature, there's many, many of these different kinds of biases. I'll say something about a few of them. Um, you know, you can go into the literature and see all these different biases being um, elucidated and, and, and the wonderful um, work, you know, ethnographic work and modeling work and experimental work um, to sort of see how these different biases um, uh, either uh, help to push items across any of these four bridges um, or inhibit them from crossing any of these four bridges. Okay? So here's just some of the examples. So the connection bias, the threshold bias, the model bias, these are ones that have to do with people and their position within a social network. Okay? So you've got a bunch of uh, men here from a particular kind of social setting and the, the claim here, what we now know very well from the socio, soci, sociological work on diffusion of innovation, is that some of them are going to be better connected in the society than others. Okay, so if you teach one person um, an innovation, if they get a new word or they get a new syntactic construction, they're going to be, uh, they're more connected then, that means they're more likely uh, to, to hear it or to cause other people to hear it, that is a greater number of other people um, to hear it. Some people are not well connected and that makes a difference. A threshold bias has to do with how innovative I might be. I might be very well connected and I hear this new thing, but I, I'm not a very innovative type of guy. So then I'm not going to um, help to spread this innovation uh, throughout the community. A model bias, am I charismatic? You now other people want to copy me, um, etc. So all of these things are well-known kinds of um, biases that have an effect on whether a bit of language is going to um, take off. This sort of social, or what we might call sociometric uh, biases. Another very important category of biases are called content biases, and that has to do with, so the typical idea with content biases is that uh, if there's a certain innovation, whether it's a cultural one, technological one, whether it's a linguistic innovation, 
Um, what are its intrinsic properties? How useful is it for us? How easy is it to use? Uh, essentially, what's the balance between the costs and the benefits of this thing? And that, if, if, if the balance is good, then it has a high um, kind of content bias. So an example would be a stepladder. Very fine thing, okay? It's a very high content bias. A stepladder is very useful um, in our kind of environment. You want to be able to do something on a, on a raised um, surface and then fold that you know, thing away. Um, so that is, a, uh, is something that has spread around the world very well. So a lot of people have stepladders and they're very versatile. Um, so, you know, there, there are analogues of this in culture and analogues of this kind of thing in language. Content bias means if it's useful to me, uh, then I'm going to want to try to adopt it. So these kinds of transmission biases give a causal account of transmission and through this you can sort of build an evolutionary account of cultural transmission. But, it, um, but they're based on items, they're based on objects like, you know, step ladders or let's say, you know, linguistic items like words and so forth. The question is how do these things scale up to linguistic systems? There's no way I can go through what's here on the screen with you, um, but the basic point here is to say, I'll get it off the screen first. Um, if you study linguistics, uh, you know, all fields of study, of course, have their complexities. Um, and one of the interesting things about linguistics is that, uh, you know, you get deeper and deeper and deeper into the complexities of language. They're extraordinary. And we're all very much aware of how complex our languages are, but we're, you know, when, I shouldn't say that, I take it back. We're, we're able to um, navigate the complexities of our languages very, very well. We use our native languages very deftly, but we're hopeless at articulating what those complexities are. Uh, and yet we have strong views about what those complexities might be. So it's very hard um, to sort of get through this when um, you're talking about the structure um, of languages. But one of the key insights about languages without getting into the details of them is that they are these structured systems where all of the parts relate to all of the other parts in very particular ways. Okay, so here um, is, a, is, a, is a piece of evidence for that where you've got a whole lot of linguistic properties down one side, so they include structural properties of language to do with their morphological structure, the shape of words and, and phrases, um, structures in their sound patterns and so forth. And what you've got is two, uh, the two columns there referred to on the left, the Munda languages, and on the right, the Mon Khmer languages. And these are groups of languages that have a common ancestor. And linguists have looked at this, the relationship between these two groups of languages and they've found that they differ. If you just sort of scan your eyes down, you see on all of these properties they differ in all of these different respects. Okay, so in all sorts of different aspects of the whole system, if you think of them as, as organisms, they've now become very different looking organisms, these two kinds of um, forms of language. And the uh, linguists who I quote here, Donegan and Stamp, um, argue that this has all come down to a, a very particular change in, in, the, in the phonological structure of the languages, which had all of these knock-on effects. So their argument was that only one of these changes was an innovation in the Munda languages, and then in time, through internal structural um, dependencies and knock-on effects, they became completely different beasts. So the argument, the basic point here is that the, the parts of a language are connected to all of the other parts in really quite significant ways. Okay, so the question is, how can this be? I've just been talking about the, the sort of social, cultural evolution of linguistic items, but they've got to somehow, we've got to see what is it that connects them to all of the other ones. And for this, we need to introduce another very important bias, which is called the context bias, not the content bias. So let's take a very wonderful innovation, the banana. Okay, so obviously, you know, um, this was not made by humans. But it was adopted by humans. So, you know, bananas um, grow naturally and they've become domesticated and so forth. But what I'm uh, pointing to is the, is, the, uh, is the content. Well, we know about the content biases of bananas. They're delicious, they're nutritious, they're a good size for a snack, etc. You can get them all around the world. Um, but if you want to grow them, okay, uh, quite apart from the content bias, what makes them good, um, you, there is a, there's a the, sorry, the content bias, what makes them good, there's a context bias. You can grow them if this is the sort of environment you live in, not if this is the sort of environment you live in. So there's a very particular relationship between the innovation and the context uh, in which it sort of is either used or in which it thrives. So let's go back to our stepladder example and think, okay, what's the context in which that is something that you would actually want to either invent or adopt? 
Well, it's got to have to do with the human body. Of course, it's designed to fit the human body. It's got to do with human goals, human intentions, the kinds of things that we need to do. Um, the environments we're in, we've got firm, flat surfaces, uh, etc. So what we then start to see is that there's a relationship of interdependency between the structure of one of these items and the context in which it fits. Okay, the design of a stepladder is no accident. It's like a kind of construction between us. I mean, it's not a, I don't mean a construction in itself. It's constructed, but the relationship between a human being, not just their body, but also their intentions, and the structure of the stepladder is like a kind of a grammatical relationship by analogy, if you like. So you're not going to innovate something like that unless you already had the kind of context in which it makes sense. And then as soon as that's been set up, then you start to see the innovation of other things, like for example this little piece that goes in the middle to stabilise it, which now makes sense only insofar as you've already introduced the stepladder. So this is the kind of so-called ratchet effect where once you've introduced a certain structure, another one can be introduced in a way that, um, that only makes sense given that you, you, you brought the first one in. So what I'm trying to show you here is that these so-called um, standalone items, like say this little stabiliser thing on, in between the two parts of the stepladder, yes they get um, adopted as individual items, but they only work in, in so far as they have a kind of a combinatory relation to a set of other aspects of their kind of context. So in this way, you know, when we adopt or invent bicycles, that presupposes a range of things. A ringtones a pre <coughs> presuppose a range of things. Tools like saws presuppose a range of things. And if you get into grammatical structures, like for example, agreement systems, many languages have agreement systems, um, they will only work um, if certain other features um, are going to be there in the language. So, um, this leads to the question, that specifically to language, I've been using this kind of toy example of, uh, you know, bananas and, and, uh, and stepladders. I want to introduce two ways in which we can think about how the items of language can form up into the systems that we're trying to explain, you know, in sort of cultural evolutionary terms. And um, I'll just sort of briefly talk about them. Two mechanisms, one um, we might call uh, motivation or semantic or, or sort of motivation in terms of meaning, semiotic motivation maybe more accurately, um, and what we might call um, enclosure. So um, I'll, I'll give you concrete examples here. Firstly, to look at motivation, we can go to Darwin's discussion um, of essentially the, the meaning of animal communication systems uh, in his book on the expression of emotion. This is one of his uh, illustrations. The dog that is indicating its aggressive state of mind. Okay, so here's an argument which says that the physical uh, features of the dog illustrate its, uh, have a, what he calls a functional relation to its state of mind. So it looks the way it looks, it's puffing up its skin, it's holding down its ears. Uh, it, it, these types of signals have a functional relation to its aggression. So the stiff posture, etc., stands for a hostile frame of mind and as a receiver of this signal, we can sort of see a functional link. But then he posed this puzzle, well, what about another sort of state? This is his illustration of a dog in what he calls an, an affectionate uh, frame of mind, and, and, and it engages in what he calls flexuous uh, behavior, uh, and flexuous movements. Well, his argument was actually this is a kind of a second order semiotic relationship, right? So he's basically saying that this, the, the flexuous movements are actually what he called the opposite of, or the antithesis was his word, of the stiff posture, just as the affectionate frame of mind is the antithesis of the hostile frame of mind. So what you're getting is a classic relation between relations, um, you know, and it's sort of um, the classic semiotic kind of uh, theory of, 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 of saussure. That's basically the core idea behind what a, a, a linguistic system is built on. It's built on relations between relations exactly this kind. So you've got a relation between a certain kind of posture and another kind of posture standing for the relation between um, a certain kind of frame of mind and another. So this gives you a hook into how different elements of a system actually come to have meaning in relation to other elements of the system. And the second um, person I want to quote, this is on the second point on domain enclosure, Zip, um, so the famous uh, uh, linguist, if you go back to his 1949 book, he has this wonderful discussion that of, of human language as a set of tools. 
And the basic argument is that once you, you can look at a language as he did, as a collection of words, okay, which clearly it's a lot more than that, but what's interesting is his whole theory was to say uh, language, that all of the words in a language are like all of the tools in a workshop. Okay, so you go into a workshop and what you see here is that the tools um, are all part of the same domain of functionality. Okay, so just as in language all of the words and the constructions are part of the same sort of general domain of functionality, we use them to say things to other people. They are placed in particular locations in relation to other ones. Some of them are used more frequently than other ones. It's the same in kitchens, it's the same in you know, all sorts of sort of structures that we have. Once you, in, once you enclose a sort of domain of functionality, then its parts come to actually change through their relationship to other parts. And this is the basis of his famous uh, laws. Um, so for example, the one that the most often used tools are the ones that are lightest and most versatile. So in language, uh, the most frequent words are the ones that are the lightest and the smallest. So the idea here is that using these kinds of mechanisms, you can get items to form up into a system through these three fundamental uh, processes. One is you get them to congregate into a sort of a uh, into the same sort of space as in a workshop. You get them to specialise their functions in relation to each other, and then you get them to um, combine insofar as they interlock. So this is what happens: you get congregation of all of the of all of the words of a language just purely due to the sociometric structure, for example, of, you know, you get families and communities who talk more to each other than they do to other people. This creates a centripetal force. The items of language don't just <coughs> spread across the land, they actually get channeled into the same kind of bag. Then once you've got that happening, when a child of this age is, is being exposed to language only from, uh, you know, in a, in a very stable community like this, you get what's called normal transmission. Okay, so here's your tree structure. It's not the same tree that Tecumseh was talking about. This is a tree structure depicting the history of languages. Uh, uh, you know, language A branches out into these other languages. Actually, the idea here is that that's just shorthand for the, um, for the passing on of item after item after item. But in a normal uh, sociolinguistic situation, they, those uh, items all get passed on in a huge big set. That accounts for why words are in a, in a sort of you know, the, all the words of the language are there, but it doesn't yet tell us how they have uh, all of these kind of combinatoric um, relations. Well, for that, um, we can look at uh, now at the sort of the true kind of causal uh, locus of grammatical relations, and that is the utterance. Okay, so I've been talking about things like the stepladder and so forth, this context um, bias. Well, if we look at utterances, Okay, so these are not words, but the actual utterances that we speak, for example, in the tone-taking examples I gave, we see that every time we produce an utterance that's complex, not only do we communicate all of the meanings that are denoted by, by, by the parts of them, but we also advertise the, the, the combinatoric relations that those items have. So one little item that's here in red will fit into an utterance in a certain way that will actually uh, promote, in a sense, the, the structural relations of the language. So we see evidence um, from what's possible to borrow in languages. We see different uh, degrees of embeddedness of these items within the language. So, for example, uh, it's very easy to borrow a noun from a language into another language because languages tend to have slots that nouns can be put into, whereas it's very hard to um, to uh, borrow things like so-called fused affixes because they presuppose a certain kind of uh, grammatical structure. All right, so I'm going to just skip on because time is, um, and I'm going to stop in about one minute. So the summary of this part here is to say um, that the way that we, there, are, there is a way that we can get from the well-known causal processes of item-based transmission in populations to the also well-known uh, large sort of structural properties of languages as whole systems, and that is through these three ingredients for the emergence of systems. So one is that you get the, uh, the, the enclosure of a, of a set of words within a community that's using them, and essentially that, that's what accounts for the, the lexicon of the language or the contents of the dictionary, if you like. Then you're getting this notion, and these are the two notions that uh, Zipf outlined. Um, you're getting the functional alternativity of different words, that I can use this one or this one, which one do I pick? That's the kind of classic element of the so-called paradigmatic relations that grammars give you in language. 
and then the idea that words get incorporated into structures with other words in our utterances, and that's the classic uh, syntagmatic um, uh, relation of, of uh, grammar and what we call morphosyntax. So, to conclude, um, the, uh, so that was the second part, and what I want to do now is just very quickly conclude. The first point here is I want to say that if we're talking about the evolution of the language capacity, there's so many things that we want to deal with. Um, uh, as we've heard, one of the things that's, that we can add to that um, is not only sort of social intelligence and theory of mind, but the cooperative element of language usage and the shared intentionality and the, the sort of moral regulation that takes place around it. Secondly, um, to capture the cultural evolution of language systems, which was what the second part was about, um, we really need to look at multiple causal frames in interaction. So I, I, I tried to kind of draw on um, different ones. Uh, so some of them would have to do with causal frames of diffusion of innovation within an entire society, but at the same time we're looking at causal frames that have to do with utterances being used in context and the way in which the uh, the embeddedness of items within structures advertises the structure of the system. So that's within the kind of anchronic uh, frame. So those, those distinct causal frames interact, and if we want to understand the way that language evolves, we need to be able to understand precisely that um, interaction. And, and today what I've tried to do is to foreground uh, the anchronic frame, which I would argue plays a key role, but which is, you know, it's, it's not, it's not labelled, so therefore, it, is, it doesn't come into play so much in the sort of discussions that we normally have. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.